Hi, Frederick. Hi, Matt. Good morning. Hello, hello. Hello. Nice to see you. <laughs> hello, how are you? <laughs> good, good, good. Uh, I'm reporting to you from the Cambridge, Massachusetts Penitentiary. Oh, my goodness. Why? <laughs> I'm, I, I'm kidding. I'm reporting okay. from my parking lot. Okay. Where I'm unpacked, <laughs> where I'm bringing in a cooler because we spent the weekend in Provincetown. I see, um, I see. <laughs> uh, for a, for 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 a Pride weekend, it was pretty. Oh, cool. very cool, very so, cool. <laughs> yeah, Hi, so, Jerome. Yes. <laughs> nice to see you. <laughs> Hi, Ilta. Hi, how are you? I'm, <laughs> I'm so excited for today's presentation. It's going to be really too. cool. I've been we looking, finally got I've been Fred. looking forward to it. <laughs> And um, and that's not a dig about last week. Actually, I had a thing ready to go to social media that I was going to post, like right as the meeting started. And, and uh, I I remember to hold off, you know, oh, don't yes, count I your know, chickens before they've hatched. <laughs> and um and so so we're going to hit LinkedIn and uh, Twitter and things. So um I want to make good. sure I, I get your abstract and such. And it's in the uh, it's in the doc. Post um, and cross post. Matt, it's in I saw the doc. It. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, again, Fred, Fred, oh, is, uh, you know, he, he provided us a nice uh, abstract. So we'll wait a bit for the folks to join in and then get started. So, Fred, uh, have you been uh, busy <laughs> or what? <laughs> I think. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Understatement. Look at this. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I dinged my, uh, I, I have a small cut from just loading and unloading gear, but check oh this out. Gosh. I have a Stars and Galaxies Band-Aid, which wow. is <laughs> just cool. But um, yeah, we do, what, uh, when do we want to, do we want to open the meeting at 12.05 for, for real? To yes, yeah, yeah, just in, just in a couple of minutes. Let's wait for folks okay. to. Yeah, what, one thought I had too was if we had any business, like normal business, we could yeah, as usual do that can, first, and then sure. and then if you wanted to go long or need to go long, um, it's we can one do that. We talked about at the yeah. TOC over the last couple of months that uh, just you know there's not really a time limit if you go last, and then when we this will be part of our expert speaker series. I've been doing some work to go through and call the talks from the meetings, so those links are just the talk. So, um, cool. Yeah. So so don't feel rushed. Um, I think I think Matt, uh, did you want to cover a couple of things and then we can get started? Uh, I mean, hand it over to Fred after that. Yeah, if it's if it's just going to be us, I will just say uh, I'll be posting the meetings uh, from the last meeting we had, which was small, but we had a really interesting discussion on agent based AI uh, and observability and a couple of things like that. Um, different ways to use LLMs and such, as you as you recall, as well as today's meeting. Uh, and I'm just about ready to roll out uh, a MIT and Apache based um, tool that tags can use. We've had an issue for almost two years in the tag repo marked as help wanted, the tag observability repo on helping to sort of formalize and organize our more than 400 videos that, that, that we have from meetings and various talks and working groups over the last four plus years. We average about mm -hmm. 100 videos a year. Uh, and they're all largely, um, they're all there and they all have descriptions, but they don't have things like chapters and consistent um, beginning and ending boards, uh, as well as uh, searchable summaries. Uh, and so using some some AI tools uh, um, and, and a little bit of Python, um, uh, uh, I've, I've got something largely automated that I believe I'm about to let loose on our 400 videos. So we'll have searchable, indexable, linkable, you know, uh, really great looking stuff that we can edit easily in mass even after we do the initial work uh, cool, which cool. will include extracting uh, relevant bits and summarizing coherently you know and succinctly um, some of the main points of the talks um, and the one thing I wanted to get feedback from from folks and I'll put this in the issue too since there's not many here today uh, is after doing that I'd like to and we have a second issue for formalizing uh, how we manage our YouTube content, how we schedule speakers and and, and, and all of that. Uh, mm -hmm. I would like to have that workflow and here's where I would love community feedback. I would love that workflow to include 
you know, after summaries and such are generated, we should first circle back with the speaker and ensure that whatever was generated remains consistent with their intent and, and, and their messaging um, mm -hmm. as, as it's their talk, uh, followed by like a community round maybe for a week or two in, in GitHub where, you know, we can kind of Wikipedia style ensure that we're not only correct, but that, you know, interesting, valuable things that uh, uh, weren't automatically generated are included in those notes. Uh, and then I'd also like us to come together around how we present this to the technical community outside of the CNCF, which is why we're doing all of this to build our, our membership and build our communities. Mm -hmm. uh, so over the next month, I'd say, I'd like to take these now nearly two year old issues that we created um, now that we have uh, tools and means to address them. Uh, so I just want to give a heads up that that's ongoing and I'll be making some posts uh, later on this week. Uh, I'll be using your talk today as the, the, the guinea pig since it's relevant and timely. Um, cool, cool. Very good. Oh, oh, I'll to make sure. I, why don't you open the meeting formally? I'm going to move some stuff around and turn my video off and okay. reappear <laughs> at a much more <laughs> professional looking background. So, All right. That yeah. sounds good. <laughs> okay. Um, I think we're uh, five minutes past. So hi, everyone. Uh, good morning from West Coast and Fred. Uh, very happy to be having you on the tag meeting today as our expert, you know, speaker. Um, and I know that you have been doing some really wonderful work in observability, you know, from searchability to query latency to, you know, uh, contributing uh, consistently to Prometheus as well as Thanos. Uh, and in the also participating in the Kubernetes uh, instrumentation sig. So super happy to be having you. And uh, of course, last but not least, you know, running your company, <laughs> Polar Signals, you know, doing uh, uh, a lot of great stuff. So the, thank you for joining in today. And uh, we, I think your your speak your topic today. And again, feel free to add more here, Fred. Is that uh, is on why and how to build a database for observability. I think that this also dovetails very well into some of the um, you know work that you have done at Polar Signals. You know, driving some of the design and architecture of uh, the uh, components that you know you guys have been building, in, but also in the open source community. So, with that said, again, super happy uh, to have you. Uh, and uh, please, you know, go ahead, introduce more details about your talk, and uh, look forward to it. Awesome! Thank you so much for having me. I'm gonna start out with just sharing my screen. All righty. I think Hi, everybody Sofa. can see that. Yes, we can see it. Right. Okay, yeah, awesome. So um, yeah, today we'll be talking about why and how to build a database uh, for observability. Um, and I think um, the first one that we definitely have to answer very quickly is uh, why are we doing this? So for those who aren't familiar with Polar Signals, um, what we do is continuous profiling. Um, and probably this group um, already, already knows about this because you know, it's part of the uh, white paper that this group um, wrote. But just for you know, anybody who may not be familiar with this um, or who may be watching the recording, um, continuous profiling, as the name says, is essentially always profiling all of your production infrastructure. And one thing that we do a little bit, um, what's kind of special about Polar Signals, and I won't be talking too much about this uh, today, but uh, because it's more about the collection of this data, we actually do something that we also call system-wide profiling. So there are a lot of continuous profiling um, projects and products out there where um, you know maybe you're looking at a single application and it's it sends either profiling data about itself or uh, you know you observe a single process um, over time and you report profiling data. With um, Polar Signals, we created this uh, open source project called Parka, P-A-R-C-A, -A, um, where we have an eBPF-based agent that um, always collects absolutely everything about all the processes on a host. And typically you deploy this on a Kubernetes cluster. And so you kind of profile absolutely everything in your Kubernetes cluster all the time, um, which also incidentally has a really 
amazing experience because it's zero instrumentation. So all you do is deploy a single daemon set and, and it's kind of all done. Um, but kind of taking a step back uh, to just uh, profiling. Profiling itself is kind of as old as software engineering itself. Um, when we did our research on this, like we basically found uh, references all the way, you know, back to the 60s and 70s, where this was already very well established practice. Um, and what profiling is, is that you essentially record um, what, where resources are being spent. So this could be memory, this can be CPU time and so on. And then you record where, um, you know, in which functions this is being spent. And then because we now understand this, we can actually do something about this, right? So it can inform our software development decisions. Um, so typically, you know, in the case of CPU profiling data, this is what um, a profile of a single process may look like, right? So we have all the stack traces and we're recording um, for how much time have we observed um, this partic particular, you know, function call stack. Um, typically, these are sampled. So um, usually the way this then works, and also this is the way that it happens to work uh, with Polar Signals and Parka, we essentially look um, X amount of times per second, um, what is the current function call stack? And that's what we use to essentially build statistics to tell us um, where is, fun uh, is time being spent. Because statistically speaking, um, you know, if we look at, at what is the current function call stack, let's say 100 times per second, then if we see the same function call stack twice, then that's 20 milliseconds, right? Um, and the longer we do this, the higher the st statistical significance gets for this. And the traditional kind of profiling, where we look at, let's say, a single process for a 10 second period of time, and we profile at a relatively high frequency, is kind of where this type of data may um, originate from. This um, is still useful, even in the world where continuous profiling exists. But there are some kind of uh, choices here, uh, some trade-offs. Um, so with point-in-time profiling, we're looking at doing very high frequency. Typically, that means we're also um, adding more overhead. And we need to gather statistical significance over a very short period of time. And kind of by definition, we only get that point in time. So one of the kind of natural things about continuous profiling is that we always gather all the profiling data all the time. So there's the classic observability uh, thing that like all observability data has, which is you want the history of the data because you're always going to want the data that you don't have, right? When this like weird uh, user interaction happens that you can never reproduce and so on. And so continuous profiling, again, is kind of always profiling all of our infrastructure all the time. Um, and just, um, sorry, yeah. And we do this to kind of get a holistic view throughout time that is statistically uh, significant and representative for our entire infrastructure or you know all of the in individual processes within it as well. Um, like I said, um, part of, just because it's a, a question that always gets asked, um, how do we do this? We build kind of an eBPF based um, agent that allows us to collect this at very low overhead. Happy to come back one some other time to talk about this. Um, also really cool software, I think, uh, yes, but not uh, not the, the focus of today's talk. Okay, cool. Um, so naively speaking, um, you know, I come up from a Prometheus background. Um, one of the first things that we were thinking about, right, was like, what if we just represented stack traces as just yet another dimension in Prometheus, right? Um, let's say, you know, naively speaking, it's a label in Prometheus. Um, then the data could look something like this, right? At uh, timestamp one, we have these observations. At timestamp two, maybe we don't see the first stack trace at all, but we do see the second one and so on. Now, um, folks familiar with the Prometheus storage may already spot a problem with this, which is stack traces 
by their nature are unbound cardinality, right? Like Prometheus works by essentially having relatively stable cardinality and can apply a bunch of really cool optimizations um, by operating in that with, with those assumptions. And that's not to say that, you know, Prometheus is bad because this kind of use case doesn't work with that storage. It's just not what it's designed for. I mean, uh, so Fred, you'd say it, it kind of uh, performance degradation can be seen, right? Like if you have unbounded cardinality in, in, in a Prometheus setup, right? So definitely, I'm, or, I'm you know, step. you're, you, you pay in Prometheus, you pay per um, unique ac and active time series, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. um, as opposed to paying per sample, for example. And this is exactly. kind of the ultimately where, where we'll get to. Again, that's, that's not to say that the trade-off that Prometheus chose is necessarily wrong, because if you ha do have a relatively sa stable number of um, time series, you can apply some really interesting optimizations so that mm -hmm. for that special case, it actually works really well. Um, but that only works in a world where you can actually have a relatively stable uh, cardinality. Yes. Exactly. Um, <laughs> but, you know, code executing is kind of by definition hard, high cardinality, Absolutely. right? Absolutely. Um, but um, co coming back to kind of our, our data model, we do still want to offer a Prometheus style experience um, because we feel this is something, you know, that will feel familiar to people um, and you know people already understand this data model it's hard enough to learn one thing right um, the idea was if people already learned how to deal with Prometheus hopefully this will feel very familiar so we kind of have the same thing where we have um, you know a name is kind of the the or type of profile is kind of equivalent to the metric name in Prometheus and then we can have an arbitrary uh, set of selectors. This is kind of, this was what we wanted to create. Um, and we had already understood that, you know, using an actual Prometheus style storage was not uh, going to work. And just to uh, kind of demonstrate this one more time, super, super quickly, I have a very quick demo here. Um, um, I'm showing this with Polar Signals Cloud, but everything that you're seeing here works exactly the same way in the Parka open source project. Cool. Um, it's just, you know, the thing that I know is definitely going to work right now. <laughs> um, so, uh, you know, we, at the top here, we see just kind of a CPU total metrics graph. This is kind of similar to Prometheus. And when we scroll down here, we see all of the CPU time spent across the entire infrastructure for the last 15 minutes. Um, and we can go ahead and kind of slice and dice this data by uh, you know container name, so like distributor. This is, for example, the component in our infrastructure that processes queries. You know, and all of this kind of feels very Prometheus native, but we needed to you know solve all of those cardinality problems with uh, this data. Mm -hmm. So how did we do that? Um, the first thing that we wanted to do was, you know, let's figure out what is the like back of the envelope math here, because um, th there is something unique here, right? We we want still, um, you know, real time queries. We want um, the the responses to these queries to be in like sub second uh, latency. We don't want to have to wait, you know, thirty seconds for a report. We felt like that was not going to be acceptable. Um, so it's kind of um, you know, what what kind of bounds are we moving um, moving within? So, you know, we took the example of um, 100 uh, stacks per second is what we're looking at. Um, and we do that per CPU um, and, you know, multiply that by a typical number of um, hosts. So here, you know, we have 100 hosts. Obviously, this can be way more. You know, we see definitely users with tens of thousands of nodes um, definitely works as well. Uh, but you know, this was the this is kind of the average user we see very very often. Uh, so we're dealing with you know at least ten billion samples per day that we need to query at sub second um, uh, query latency. So this you know obviously poses some challenges. Um, this is kind of difficult to store and query at um, at, at sub second um, latency. Um, there's a question in uh, in chat, so I'll, I'll go into that right away. Um, 
Understood Prometheus storage is not adapted to this type of data because of cardinality. So would storing Prometheus data in this format actually work fine or would there be some specific Prometheus uh, use case that would not be adapted? So if I'm understanding this correctly, um, the question is, could I store Prometheus storage as Prometheus data in this um, database? And that's absolutely possible. We actually already have a proof of concept that shows that this is possible. Um, now, Prometheus is definitely still like, it's very integrated, very well optimized uh, throughout. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. it certainly won't perform the same way today, but we do see a future where this could be possible. Great question. That's a really great question. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. It's, very cool. um, like, it's really a proxy question in my mind to, uh, can I just wholesale replace my approach with this? from a data model perspective, which is the, yeah, yeah. Which, which I think is the key insight. Yeah, yeah, ho ho hopefully in the future, this will be possible. There's there's a, you know, road ahead of us, uh, but hopefully this will be possible one day. Yes, that's certainly the vision. Um, so we kind of um, had our back of the envelope math. We knew what kind of experience we wanted to create. So we did a bunch of experimenting and, and the experimenting did include, you know, also trying to modify the Prometheus storage and maybe we were just wrong, right? And it'll work just fine, um, which, you know, we very quickly realized this wasn't going to work out. Um, but what we did realize was, you know, the two things that are going to be really important for this kind of storage is we need to be able to aggregate data very quickly and we need to, um, and that's both in numbers and by label values, right? Um, and ideally we can make searching by the label values relatively fast as well. So we very quickly landed in columnar database land um, because you know, we can exploit the locality of data very um, like a lot by you know, scanning very quickly through labels and then also doing aggregations over um, sample data very quickly. Um, so just um, logically thinking about the layout of this data, right? Um, this is roughly, you know, what we see a, a lot. We have, we want to be able to represent um, an arbitrary set of labels. So in this case, you know, I just took something that's kind of familiar from Kubernetes land. We want the, the pod name to be available, maybe the node name. You know, usually there's a whole lot more here Maybe you saw in the demo, um, you know, we have, you know, the pod labels as well, the container name, all sorts of metadata. Um, and then the actual interesting data for profiling, right? The stack traces, the timestamps, and how often have we actually observed um, this stack? Um, there's a little bit more in terms of metadata here, actually, because we can also store stuff like, you know, memory profiling data and so on, but not so interesting uh, from a storage perspective. Um, the the problem here was, um, of course, you know, we didn't go straight to let's build a database. Definitely fun, right? But um, uh, we wanted to figure out whether there was something out there that we could just use, right? Mm -hmm. um, of course, if we don't have to maintain software, we'd, we'd prefer not to. Um, and so we looked at existing uh, columnar databases out there, um, but to, um, but unfortunately, this is uh, this kind of combination of problems hasn't re hadn't really been solved because um, we need to be able to exploit this locality specifically for labels um, in order for any of this uh, to work. Um, and so, with existing columnar databases, the only way to kind of represent a set of labels was through um, kind of map types. And the problem here is. Uh, we're kind of losing the whole benefit of columnar uh, data uh, by doing this. Essentially, we're turning you know, the label querying part of this database back into like a relational database, basically, where we need to look at every single row to determine does this actually match our label set, right? Or you know, our label matcher. Um, so this wasn't going to work out. I will say. Um, if we were to look at the landscape today again, this may look a little bit different. Existing columnar databases um, have started to adapt some of these use cases, um, but at the time, this was about three years ago, um, there was absolutely nothing available for us. 
Um, and maybe more um, broadly speaking, we actually knew of a number of other um, observability companies that have built storages that uh, you know have this kind of capability. I think most uh, prominently the folks from Honeycomb have written about this uh, type of functionality um, and necessity about a database like this um, on their blog as well. And so um, this is what we ideally want to end up with, right? We want to be able to logically say, okay, um, I'm not actually repeating this data all the time. I can um, both exploit the like repeated repeatedness, I don't know if that's the word, um, of uh, of the data, right? Um, in this case, you know, I want to be able to just say, okay, I have six times um, my pod value here, six times my node and so on, and I'm seeing the same stack traces multiple times. And so this is obviously a way, a much more efficient way to encode this data uh, while still be being able to, um, you know, do scans very efficiently over this, because if the next thing is, you know, 10 times some other value, we just need to actually look at two real values to be able to process um, a filter. Um, so this is sort of where we wanted to uh, end up at. Um, and so unfortunately, at the end of all of our um, investigation, we came to the conclusion, if this is the query experience that we want to build, we got to build this database ourselves. Um, and so one really core component of this database is something that we call dynamic columns. Um, and this is special because uh, basically in the database, we have a what we call mostly static schema. Uh, so basically the stack trace, the timestamp, the value, those are all, uh, and you know, a bunch of other things that are just omitted for, you know, um, the, the sake of these slides. But um, you know, there's a there's a number of columns that we can guarantee are always going to be there, and then the labels columns they can dynamically be expanded. We can essentially, um, on a chunk level, have you know unlimited number of um, label names here, um, and uh, they can they we already know what type they will be. You know, there's this is essentially deeply embedded into our schemas where we say, okay, there's the labeled column that is dynamic, but everything underneath um, you know, this prefix is definitely going to be a string column. It's gonna be you know, run length encoded. It's gonna be ZSTD uh, compressed. So it's a mostly static schema that allows us to do these things because then with a static schema, we can still do all sorts of really good uh, query optimizations, right? When we know the types, when we know the layout and so on. Um, so yeah, uh, now we can actually do this kind of layout, right? We know um, that um, on a chunk level, this is the truly materialized schema, right? Um, and this is actually pretty important that we only keep the um, truly materialized schema on a chunk level because we allow essentially unlimited number of columns here, right? So if we actually kept a truly global schema throughout all of all of time, it would, you know, the schema itself would explode. Um, and so that's why it's really important that we keep the schema local um, to mm -hmm. the chunk. Mm -hmm. um, but ultimately to truly exploit um, the you know efficient encoding of like run length encoding and so on as much as possible, we actually also need to globally sort this data. Um, now, this is, uh, you know, there are a bunch of tricks that we're applying here and this is mostly true. <laughs> um, you know, sorting, sorting is kind of an interesting thing, but long story short, um, you can basically always think of data as being sorted by the, the predefined uh, sorted columns. Whether that's truly always true may actually you know, differ. And the query engine essentially knows um, you know, this query that, that's being run actually is going to benefit from being uh, truly sorted and then may you know, do stuff like a K-way sorted merge of um, uncompacted data to um, still return a globally sorted um, scan. Um, 
Right. Um, another thing um, that's uh, pretty interesting is uh, we essentially, I was talking about sorted data earlier. We essentially require that any um, data that's being written is already sorted by the sorting columns. And this is exactly what allows us to do or maintain global sorting um, in a very cheap way, right? Because all the data is already sorted. So all merges. So when we convert, for example, our L0, which are error, Apache error records to Apache Parquet, um, all we're really doing is, uh, you know, we're not actually ever sorting data again. All we're doing is kind of doing a, a, a slightly more intelligent merge um, of data. And therefore we're ensuring that all of this data continues to be uh, sorted throughout. And the sorting again is kind of important for both um, efficiency of um, the encodings, but it also helps with query latency because if the encoding is really um, efficient with stuff like run length encoding, we actually also need to do much less work in order to you know, scan the data, to multiply you know, the same numbers with each other and so on. Um, yeah, but in essence, the database kind of looks like um, an LSM tree, but uh, you know, we uh, eventually, or we try to very quickly compact this data and then quickly ship it off to object storage. We have another question in chat. Um, are you also using caching to support uh, fast indexing under the hood for sorting? So the, the these compactions are essentially that caching layer. Um, so very quickly, do we try to compact from um, L0 to L1? Um, and every time we do that, we kind of merge all of the records from one um, compaction level to, to the next and therefore kind of materializing the sorting very quickly. Mm -hmm. um, good, good question though. Uh, uh, there was one more. Um, I need to drop off. Okay. Um, all right. Then, um, one last uh, kind of unique thing about um, basically all observability data is that um, you know the thing that is writing data is practically never the thing that is reading. Um, and this is important, right? Basically, we have machines writing data, and humans are the ones reading this data. And so, uh, this is important because that means we don't actually need to care about uh, reading your own rights. Um, we can kind of have the consistency of the transactions um, resolve itself and humans don't actually realize. What people actually do is they just hit the search query or you know run query again to update um, the, the most recent data. And so this plus that uh, observability data is read uh, write only, uh, which is, you know, a machine doesn't uh, decide actually my temperature at, you know, time, I don't know, minus two hours was actually something different, right? That's not really, uh, not really something that happens. Or, you know, if it does, it's something that we explicitly said uh, we will not support with this database. Um, and then uh, in order to essentially have very high throughput transactions, what we do is we um, have a relatively low timeout on transactions. And we um, any earlier transaction can block newer ones from kind of being promoted by the watermark. But um, that way, because we also have um, timeouts on all of the transactions, what we do is we can very quickly release uh, transactions in batches. Um, and that you know allows for very, very high um, throughput. Again, this only really works because it's a write-only um, or an append-only workload um, where you know data essentially never gets updated. Um, and because reading your own writes doesn't really matter. Um, there was another question in chat. Um, that might be where Prometheus use case differs due to rule groups. Um, you, you still have the same kind of I, consistency, actually, in Prometheus. I, I'm referring to like no read after write consistency. Like in Prometheus, in the rule group, you can chain your recording rule, and that assumes that the results of your previous recording rule is readable right away, right? 
That's yeah, that's absolutely right. Um, this type of thing can still be modeled uh, with this database, though, because you can the the writer can still wait for a transaction to be um, released. The idea is essentially, typically, the writer doesn't care when the uh, when when it's released. It just cares that the write has actually happened. Whether the transaction has been released, it doesn't actually care about. But if you want to care about it, you can. But I yeah, see. good. You actually, you, you're totally right. Um, so yeah, all of this, um, you know, allows us to have a pretty high throughput write path um, because that's. Um, you know, as a provider, what we care about, but actually as users, you don't really care about that it's, you know, high throughput, low latency, and so on. Uh, you care about that your queries um, are complete um, reliably and at low latency, right? And so the first uh, kind of uh, query latency bottleneck that you uh, run into with this type of thing, and this is actually something that we also learned all the way back um, in the Thanos project um, is that you don't want to have to kind of go and scan some metadata about uh, blocks in object storage all the time, because those have relatively high you know, round trip latency and your latency would grow with the amount of uh, data that you have. That's something that you want to avoid as much as possible. Obviously, the more data you're querying, the um, the more resources it's going to cost. Um, but hopefully, you know, we can amortize as much um, of that cost as possible. And uh, one of the ways that we're doing this is using um, Apache Iceberg. Um, I could do an, an, an entire talk about Apache Iceberg, but essentially um, it allows us to uh, do compactions against object storage um, and still have kind of atomicity um, and at the same time, be able to do metadata look lookup, like you know which blocks of data contain these time ranges and stuff like that, which is typically the way that you query observability data, right? Um, and so these kind of things we can do at constant lookup times. Um, super cool project, um, and this is this is essentially how uh, one of the key pieces of how we optimize um, queries against object storage. Okay, so all of this is, is very fun, uh, but isn't it super hard uh, to get uh, databases right? All right, um, that was you know definitely also a fear that we had when we embarked um, on this journey, and this is absolutely true, right? Like getting databases is right is extremely hard. Um, it's no wonder that you know most databases when uh, when they're being created, it takes like four years, five years uh, to you know reach any yeah. amount of um, you know, re reliability um, and so on. And we've all seen the Jepson tests of uh, you know, databases horribly falling over, and we definitely didn't want to be one of those databases. Um, and there was, uh, I don't know if people know about this person, but um, I had a conversation early uh, this year with a fellow database enthusiast, um, Phil. Um, where I basically said, you know, he would, he asked me, what do I think is, uh, you know, my my biggest worry? What keeps me up at night right now? Um, and I was saying that I was really worried because we haven't had like a catastrophic um, failure of our database in a while. And you know, at first it was like kind of a weird statement to make, right? Because like, well, if everything's working, what's the problem, right? Well, the problem is. Um, we didn't really understand our like uh, failure modes super well, right? Uh, we happen to have built something good enough that hasn't failed in a while, but we don't know necessarily how it's possibly going to fail in the future. Um, and so basically um, there's been a question, especially in the database world, but honestly, this kind of thing can be applied to any type of software about how can we improve um, the engineering of extremely mission critical systems? I think there's a question. Um, yeah, have you, I mean, uh, before I forget, and I can hold these to the end, but uh, have you actually done either the back of the napkin, I'm sure, but have you actually just tried to, to, to make things die intentionally as, a, as an exercise? And do you know what those limits are? 
Um, yeah, uh, absolutely. Even if, it, but... even if it's artificial and contrived, uh, it's still interesting to help frame scope when people are now talking about billions and trillions and exabytes and 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 the rest. Um, yeah, absolutely. And yeah, to, that's what a, we're that's yeah. what we're about to about to get to. Ah. Um, <laughs> So the, the answer to this is uh, something that the database community calls deterministic uh, simulation testing. Um, and this is how we essentially um, have, like, create more confidence in our database. And I'll talk a little bit about what deterministic simulation testing is um, for a couple of minutes now and how we ended up implementing it. So um, the first thing, you know, it's in the, in the word, it's got to be deterministic. So it has to be possible to repeat these tests. And, you know, when something fails that we get the same failure again. Um, and this is kind of, this sounds contrary at first, but um, deterministic simulation testing also relies on randomness, but not randomness as in um, our software behaving in random ways, but that we are generating random inputs, random operations, random events into our system. Um, and, you know, random, random failures of um, all sorts of things. But all of these things are seeded through randomness. So essentially, um, in a nutshell, when you have deterministic simulation testing, what you do is you generate a random seat at the start of your deterministic simulation. Um, you hand that uh, seed to your uh, simulator. That simulator generates a sequence of operations, failures, and so on against your system, in this case, our database, um, and then you know, actually executes those. And um, if we happen to hit a um, failure of some sort, typically after the deterministic simulation, you check whether some invariants of uh, those operations are correct. You know, if you're um, summing up all of the data, do we get um, the the right um, values? Do we, you know, do we see the amount of records um, that we expect to see? All these kinds of invariants that you're testing. Um, to, to check is the system essentially healthy after these uh, you know, catastrophic events, more or less. Um, and there is uh, some prior art. I think the, the first one that was kind of popularized is FoundationDB's flow. Um, so in case folks aren't familiar with this, um, FoundationDB, the folks that created it, essentially before ever working on FoundationDB, spent like two years building this deterministic simulator in order to then essentially you know, test the database um, in this way all the time. Um, and the, the folks that actually created that are the folks that uh, created this really cool company called Antithesis, where they kind of went yet another step further where they didn't just build you know, the database to be uh, deterministic, um, but also um, they created an entire hypervisor that is deterministic um, in order to essentially test any software that doesn't have to be deterministic anymore now um, in this deterministic um, hypervisor. Super cool company. Um, something to, to keep in mind though, um, if you're using a product like Antithesis, um, you still need to write that test uh, that essentially runs some workload against your um, against your system. Um, but still, um, I, I expect that one day we'll probably be using Antithesis as well. At the moment, we chose not to because it's quite an expensive product. Um, but some other um, examples of deterministic simulation testing is um, Tiger Beetle's uh, simulator, and then uh, a company called Resonate also essentially created a um, scheduler um, for, for Go that is uh, deterministic as well. So something that's kind of um, difficult about deterministic simulation testing is that your entire system needs to be deterministic in order for all of this to work. And so um, that means, you know, deterministic simulation testing is incredibly hard. And um, FrostDB, the database that we that we created, um, is written in Go. Um, and so that, on the very fundamental level, we haven't even written any database code. We need the Go runtime to be deterministic. And spoiler alert, it's not. Um, 
So we'll we'll be talking through you know how how we can get around some of those uh, limitations. Uh, then again, your code base itself needs to be deterministic as well. Um, and ideally, you're basically designing your entire system from the start to be designed for deterministic simulation testing, then you're probably going to have the best time. Um, that was like what uh, FoundationDB has done, right? Um, but hopefully I'll show you in the next couple of minutes that uh, you, know, you can get like 80% of the way there with um, less, um, less, uh, less work. Um, last one, um, one thing that's actually really important for deterministic simulation testing is it all has to run on a single operating system thread because otherwise we're essentially um, introducing non-determinism from hardware. Um, there was a question, uh, what is the storage engine being used? Um, it's completely from scratch. Um, it's based on uh, Apache Arrow and Apache um, Parquet. And then, you know, essentially we just build up a write ahead log and compact that relatively frequently until we ship it off to object storage. So there's no like rocks DB, uh, yeah, no rocks DB or anything like that um, under the hood here. It's all all completely from scratch. Um, but yeah, back to uh, deterministic simulation testing. So how can we get like eighty percent of the way there, right? Um, we understood that you know we're coming into this. You know we didn't necessarily build our entire code base. Um, from right off the bat uh, to be uh, deterministically tested. However, it was something that we always kept in the back of our, uh, our heads. So most of our code base is already deterministic anyways. Um, but how can we overcome some of these other um, limitations? So we started out with uh, writing this test that just performs some random actions against, against our database. In our case, you know, we did 512 512 times uh, inter inserts, compactions, snapshotting, rotations, restarts of the database, and so on. There are a bunch more things here. Um, and we essentially assign um, probabilities to all of these because we want to, as much as possible, um, reflect real usage, right? Where most of the time, what's happening are inserts. And then after some time, compactions happen. After some time there, you know, snapshots happen, and so on. Um, so we wanted to uh, make the probability of these things as much as possible reflect the real uh, kind of use cases. And then how can we get there to be mostly deterministic? So one kind of hack that we've done is uh, to force the Go runtime uh, onto a single operating system thread. We ended up using Wasm uh, to do that because even if you use this uh, functionality in the Go runtime where you can essentially specify how many um, operating systems threads you want the Go runtime to use, it will potentially always still spawn more, uh, essentially for internal purposes. But it makes things non-deterministic because now we're now running on multiple operating system threads again. At least parts of the Go runtime are, right? So that's kind of um, one thing. The other thing is time. And here, actually, the Go runtime has done something phenomenally awesome. And if you're familiar with the Go, um, uh, Go sandbox, where if you, if you go uh, to the Go uh, website, you can kind of try some uh, uh, snippets of Go code right, right in the browser. And the way this works is that um, you know it's using part part of why this works is it's using this uh, fake time compile tag, um, and what this does is every time there's actually anything that has to do with time, it doesn't actually wait. You know, if you do like a time dot sleep, it doesn't actually wait that amount of time. Um, it actually just inserts something um, into a protocol that tells the um, browser when to print something, let's say, you know, let's say you, you know, print something, you do a time dot sleep, and then you print something again. Uh, the browse, it's actually a protocol between um, the, th the, the sandbox that actually executes this um, and the browser. And all of this is based on fake time. This is something that if you weren't using Go, you would actually have to put a huge amount of work into um, that anything that has to do with time, um, it ends up being deterministic. 
Um, so yeah, this is, you know, here we got super lucky with the first thing, you know, uh, the Go runtime kind of randomly spawning OS threads. That's something that we needed to deal with. Here, it, we're actually really lucky that, that um, Go already has this functionality. And then ultimately, uh, the last thing, and this is where we unfortunately needed to actually create a fork of the Go, um, Go compiler for this particular use case. It's a very tiny patch. I can pull it up. Um, it's a really tiny patch. Um, basically, the important part is this one, um, where you know typically when the Go runtime uh, starts, it uh, seeds itself um, once from you know true randomness, um, and then you know any operation like map iterations. Um, anything where the Go runtime intentionally wants to in introduce uh, randomness, it will use that seed um, to produce that randomness. Um, and so this patch, you know, essentially allows us to um, reproduce the randomness uh, whenever we want to. And so that's exactly what we've done. Uh, let me redo this. Uh, I think there's a hands up. Yeah, uh, is Not this patch... Hi, uh, is this patch presently proposed in a PR? I didn't mean so to be clear, we're, it kind of happened. Um, yeah, great question. We we are talking thanks. to the Go team, um, you know, whether the patch will look exactly like this or something else is, you know, I think up for We're hidden behind a flag discussion. or something like that. Like, yeah, be, all... behind a feature flag would be good, right? Because then- Or whatever, but there is, it, a, yeah. there is a dialogue happening. It was my, is there a dialogue happening which you preemptively answered? Uh, yeah. So that's great to hear that, they're, that, that the communities are coming together. Okay, cool. Yeah, definitely. Very cool. And Another... just keep us posted in the future uh, on right, that I'll as well. It. Or send a shout out in our tag channel if you like. We'll do. We'll do. Great. Um, another, another. You know, you you saw it probably just now. Um, we we um, right now do it using an environment variable. Another thing that we've uh, thought about: what if it's a flag? that's only avail available on the go test command, for example, right? I think there are a couple of ways where I'm sure the go runtime folks would want to avoid this being abused, right? Outside of this actual use case. So yeah, yeah. conversation uh, is- please feel, please feel free to use the tag, uh, us, all of us, uh, Alita and I, and, and the other leads uh, as resources. Let's have, a, let's have a discussion in the open uh, and as tag observability, we can help broker that conversation outside yep. of the CNCF and into the relevant communities. And, yeah. it, and it, as it so happens, many of the people, for example, in the continuous profiling work stream that's, that was launched from the, the, the tag and is now an open telemetry um, uh, construct, uh, you, you know, they are from some of the same places that, that, that can weigh in in the right places at, at Google and, and, off, and elsewhere around the go. Um, mm -hmm. cool chain. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. And there's ample um, support for this kind of thing. So yeah. Um I I might have to reshare my screen, I think. I don't know. I think I'm just sharing my your uh, presentation. Oh, my presentation okay. at the moment. I just want to share my um terminal real quick to okay. show this. So I believe you can see my terminal now. Yes. Um, basically, yeah. what I've done here is I went back um, before. You know, we fixed a bunch of um, issues, um, but we had already introduced the deterministic simulation testing, and so um, I'm just going to run it with you know the random seed being you know zero, so just like nothing random at all here. Um, and I'm running this, and uh, what we're going to see in a moment here is it's going to complete and not have a failure. And then I'm going to rerun it with a known seed um, that, you know, by us just running this randomly a bunch um, over and over and over, um, a actually reproducible um, failure. And in this case, you know, it happened very quickly. We actually had a database crash that we prevented using this uh, kind of uh, methodology, right? So let me go back to my presentation now. Um, so even though we've only just started doing this, um, we've already, um, right, let me come, come back to this. Even though we've just started doing this, uh, we've already you know, 
uh, found a database crash, multiple data loss um, bugs, multiple duplicate write bugs, all these kind of things that we had not seen in you know months of operation of the database, but were certainly possible in the real world. But we've prevented them from ever actually happening in production using deterministic simulation testing, right? Um, so at the moment, um, the way that we're doing um, doing this, we don't we haven't we don't have any evidence for this, but we think there's still some non-determinism um, left in the Go runtime that we haven't discovered yet. Um, again, so far, every time we had a failure, it was actually reproducible. Um, but you know, we're just not a hundred percent sure yet. And then the next step uh, that we're going to be doing is um, right now, all we're doing is kind of logically replaying a set, set of things against the database. We're not actually injecting um, much failure yet other than randomly restarting the database um, a bunch of times. I see. Um, so um, what's really cool here is we're going to be, um, and again, the Go community comes uh, to the rescue. We're using the Wazero runtime. Mm -hmm. um, which kind of has a pluggable syscall interface where we can insert a bunch of randomness, a bunch of errors, a bunch of failures all over the place whenever we try to write something, whenever we try to read something, all these um, kinds of failures, right? Um, that, uh, you know, do happen in the real world. Disks do fail, right? Um, and so these things uh, are things that we do need to, um, need to account for, but happen relatively rarely in real life that mm -hmm. it's hard to, you know, test. But with something like this, we can actually test and anticipate failure. Yeah, and the yeah. idea is, you know, we're increasing confidence in our own database one simulation at a time. Um, I just want to give a couple of shout outs real quick, um, especially, you know, to Alfonso, who has done um, the de deterministic simulation testing work in particular, but also just generally to the folks that, you know, listen to us when we were, you know, we had this kind of crazy idea um, to, you know, still use the Go runtime and not build a custom scheduler, not, uh, you know, rewrite everything in Rust or whatever. Um, <laughs> um, and of course, you know, Will Wilson, the, I think, kind of original creator of this idea of deterministic simulation testing, um, so yeah, huge Very shout cool. out to all, all these folks. And yeah, FrostyB is um, an open source project that you can find um, on our GitHub org. Um, so yeah, if there are still any questions, I'd love to answer those. Very nice. Thank you, Fred. Um, uh, I, Matt? I, I, had a, I had a response and uh, I had two responses actually um, uh, the, fr from the latter part of your discussion. I wanted to hold off to the end so it's not to to veil or to track um, uh, in reverse order uh, of, of, of frequent uh, of recent how, how recently we covered it in terms of unknown deter unknown uh, non determinism for instances of that in the Go runtime uh, there is a source of that in how the Go scheduler uh, models schedulable entities machines uh, and unlike most other language runtimes it does not use a one uh, physical or virtualized thread as that unit of execution uh, atop physical cores. There's a third layer to the schedulers, the Go runtime schedulers data model for threads and cores. It has a, a third machine M uh, layer. Uh, and different allocations are particularly around streaming I.O. or or not, you know, just as you know, all the, all the stuff that gets scheduled. Um, can cause different sets of allocating a particular workload, a particular thread to a particular machine core to that third layer. So that is a source of non-determinism, but it's quite small and is amortized, I would imagine, incredibly quickly. But for completeness, that might be one source of minor perturbations or variants. Um, uh, the second one back was around um, the really awesome capabilities that we now have uh, around, you had mentioned vault injection using syscalls and stuff, and, and there's a, a long tradition of that going back decades in other C++ and, 
other things. And, and I wanted to say something that we did in the Windows kernel uh, a long time ago, <laughs> not to sound too much like a dinosaur, but um, um, <laughs> we used, uh, if you record the execution trace of all of the thread state transitions from one state to another, from runnable to running to sleeping to whatever the operating system I'll use. Um, uh, if you, uh, those are all points of control. And if you, as you have done here, use the go runtime sandbox with its simulation of time itself so that you can, you know, um, normalize for variations um, uh, in the underlying execution environment, which is an impossible problem otherwise, uh, then you can take a little bit longer in that simulation of time itself outside the bubble doing some processing around, well, every time a thread state transition happens, what if we tweak the scheduler via one of the scheduler hooks in the Go sandbox and the runtime has, has these hooks that are directly usable and indefinitely stall a thread or maybe overly stall a thread randomly. So just like mess with, you know, the real world happened and this thing took longer than otherwise or was blocked for some reason, physical or otherwise, which is otherwise really hard to simulate. Um, we got very uh, huge coverage of thread synchronization issues, deadlocks, mm -hmm. Oh, you mm -hmm. know, data corruption issues that are otherwise almost impossible to reproduce. That that class of bug suddenly becomes um, doable, and you can apply that technique here yep. to narrow yeah, the, um, the set of, of of executed tasks and prioritize. So, so uh, um, thank you again for also the talk. It was all wonderful. I'm I'm super enthusiastic. Uh, I can't wait mm -hmm. to promote it uh, this week, and and uh, really, I think there's a lot of interesting discussions that the community yep. could have. Um, yeah. Thank you. Um, I, I will say uh, the so thank like, you. Um, the um, preemption uh, problem of Go routines is actually already solved, um, and it's kind of by accident though, um, and that is because um, because we're running on a single operating system thread, um, and specifically for Wasm. Um, the Go runtime does not do any preemption on uh, non uh, like synchronization points. So like uh, typically, you know, on like AMD sixty four or something, the Go runtime also does preemption. Just like I don't know what the exact heuristic is, but it's like let's say for the sake of an example, after one second, right? Like it's a made up example, but it can uh, kind of preempt at any point in time, whereas. A while ago, it didn't actually do this, and it only did it when there was something to wait for, basically, right? Mm -hmm. um, so if it's I/O or something, right? Um, and so that combination of that just simply not being implemented in Wasm, um, like in the Wasm target in Go, um, and being a, on a single operating system thread, that's how we're kind of uh, actually, how we actually made preemption. Um, yeah. Okay. Already well, that makes sense. interesting. Uh, as, as a nerd for dev tooling and, and currently kind of like hooks, the Go runtime just has this wealth of, of tweakable settings that are all set to the defaults that we all take for granted. But yeah. you can really kind of warp reality or, or, or define your own reality in a Go, and yeah. Go runtime via some of those flags. And I do, I do remember reading about some of the preemption bits, and that's really well done. Yeah, that's well, cool. Good, um, really well even done. if it was an accident, I mean, hey, whatever. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right? But we, we didn't, you know, we didn't you, think you about can't it schedule until innovation. Yeah. Yes, you can't absolutely. schedule innovation well or creation, said. but you can schedule time spent doing yeah, what you do yeah. to get there. In this case, so well done. This is awesome. Yeah, Thanks. thank you. <laughs> yeah, and um, the the other thing with like um, inserting weight points uh, randomly, um, the the like not waiting for something is the thing that we already have. But the the inverse is exactly like that you mentioned, where you know we insert weight for this for like. A hundred, like a, a thousand seconds or whatever, or like essentially indefinitely, right? Um, it's a it's a way to shake out assumptions made that have should have critical 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 sections or locks, yeah. or that are applied not in consistent order, leading to deadlocks randomly, which are just maddening, uh, particularly yeah. if it's a data corruption kind of thing. So, yeah, yeah that's the that's the type of sure. thing that we don't have, so have yet. You can shake them out with with fake time. Uh, basically, we're not actually ever waiting for anything. Yeah. Um, and that already finds a bunch of weird things. Yeah. Yes. Great talk. Great talk. Thank you, Fred. And uh, again, really appreciate you taking the time today and this evening to yeah. come and uh, come and chat. This is very interesting. And 
hoping to see you at KubeCon as well as yeah. you know um, some of our other Prometheus summits and other other uh, events coming up this uh, year. We'll uh, but thank you again, and and you know please don't be a stranger. You know if there are other areas that uh, you'd like to kind of deep dive into or have some of your other uh, team members come in and join, uh, you're most welcome. Happy to. If you like, I said. <laughs> Lots of people love the like collection agent that we built with EBPF totally, as well. Happy totally. to talk about that as well. No, this is exciting stuff. I mean, there's a lot of cool innovation. So yeah, um, on that front, as a point of order, uh, while it wouldn't, while while talking about you know the, the productized uh, bits that you wouldn't want to talk about, and I have a note here to say thank you for your clear delineation uh, early on that positioned what is in the open and, and part of the project and what is part of your company. Um, that's a, uh, I'll say that's a case study. That's a, that's a very good practice uh, that, that we could even highlight uh, yeah, around yeah. just from the get-go because it helps everybody just zoom in on the important stuff, right? Yep, uh, but uh, if you did want to talk about the other stuff, if you are a CNCF uh, member uh, company, like your, your company, as you are, as you know, uh, there are resources for CNCF member webinars and we're happy to help uh, facilitate that. It's typically a, 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 a service desk issue that Alalita or I, uh, our tag chairs, I can open and we will do yeah. so. Uh, so I have Absolutely. a note here to do that, to connect you, if you're not already connected and, and should you wish it. Uh, yeah, so we, we're, we're already a member um, and you know, we, of course, we're yeah. aware of all this. Actually, the, the collection agent is also open source, so also happy to talk about oh, it Oh, very here. cool. Very nice. Oh, yeah, let, let, <laughs> let's schedule it. Cool, cool. Thanks again, uh, everyone, and have a wonderful evening, Fred. See Thanks you around. <laughs> Thanks, everyone, for joining. Bye-bye.